All right, guys, Murph's here. And today we're gonna to go over episode four of my World War II rifle comparison series with this. A Japanese Type 99 Arasaka chambered in 7.7 .7 by 58 millimeter. Now, in order to get into this video, we are gonna to need to go ahead and do a little bit of expectation management. So, guys, this is not a big channel. I do not have sponsors supplying me ammunition. I do not have the access to large private military weapons collections or museums or anything like that. So I'm not gonna be able to bring you content like uh, CNR Arsenal, who has been doing like a two year comparison of every weapon, every small arms used in World War One, and has an intention of expanding to World War II. I don't have the capabilities, so I enjoy consuming their content just as much as anyone else does. And if you haven't seen it yet, go ahead and check it out because it's extremely well done. Their production value is just amazing. It's something that I hope to achieve someday. However, what I do have access to is a friend's collection, which out of that collection, I've been able to cobble together one rifle per major player of World War II. So that's what we've been going over. A sample size of one and just discussing some of the history and my own thoughts and opinions regarding each rifle. Now, Guys, I'm very long-winded, and I know that. And each one of these videos has been longer than the last one, and with the amount of stuff that we have to unpack about this particular rifle, I suspect that this video is going to extend past 50 minutes. I am gonna try to like get through and get as much of this done as quickly and efficiently as I can, but rabbit holes do exist, and I also need to make sure that I get you guys the most thorough content that I can. So, with that being the case, I will annotate in the description where different parts of the video are gonna take place. We're gonna rehash a lot of things that I've already rehashed in the previous videos. So if you've seen some of the older content, you already know what I'm gonna say when it comes to certain buzzwords. Time is precious, guys. And I'm not looking to take any more from you than what you're willing to give me. So go ahead and check that description, run through the different chapters and get the information that you actually want out of these videos and I hope that at some point in the future you guys come back and watch the entire thing in full length when you have the time. Now with that stuff out of the way let's go ahead and get in the history of this particular rifle. So in the 1930s the Japanese invaded Manchuria and in the fighting with the Chinese forces during that time they discovered that the 6.5 by 50 millimeter chambered 38th year rifle was not performing as well as they wanted it to. They were not happy with the downrange energy and wounding capability of that particular cartridge, which in the interwar period, you see a lot of people start to go away from the 6.5 millimeter cartridge. Now, what they did discover was that the heavy machine gun cartridge, the 7.7 .7 by 58 millimeter, was actually performing quite well. So the Japanese army put out a requirement for a new rifle chambered in the 7.7 .7 by 58. So that is where these rifle trials began. Now two rifles would initially come out of the trials in 1939, a short rifle pattern and a long rifle. Now ultimately it was decided that the long rifle Type 99 did not actually outperform the short rifle pattern well enough to constitute its greater length and weight. Now let's go ahead and kind of explain the differences in rifle lengths that we're talking about right now. So, the 38th year rifle was a 28, 29 inch barreled rifle that was indicative of an older style of tactic where you would have multiple ranks of soldiers lined up front to back and then you would wanna make sure that the rearmost ranks rifle muzzle would make it past the head of the guy in the front rank so they wouldn't accidentally shoot the front rank in the back of the head. Now, World War I would put this concept more or less to rest because machine guns exist at this point and they definitely destroy lines of infantry exposing themselves to be able to fire those types of volleys. So what you see in the interwar period, and actually just a little bit before World War I as well, is the short rifle concept. Now the short rifle concept has a lot of advantages because you can provide one length of rifle to both infantry and cavalry instead of having to make instead of having to have two different production lines for long rifles and carbines, and then also having those two production lines vying for resources or manpower or whatever it is that you're after at that point. You have a short rifle, then you have literally entire factories just turning out rifles that you can send to anybody because everyone uses the same rifle. There's, there's some very obvious advantages in that process. Japan was kind of a late adopter of the concept, but not as late as some. Looking at you, Russia. So. 
Just to kind of put it further into context, a carbine runs from 18 to 20 inches in barrel length, a long rifle is about 28 to 29 inches in barrel length, and a short rifle is running around 24 to 25. So, Japanese adopt a short rifle and decide that they're going to switch everything over to this rifle and the 7.7 millimeter cartridge being the new standard and they will be actively replacing the 38th year rifles. Now just um, to kind of clarify Japanese nomenclature a little bit because it works, it still works off of year but they have a kind of different way of looking at or describing year. So a 38th year rifle, the precursor to this particular rifle, was or started production in the 38th year of the emperor, the 38th year of the reign of the emperors, which equates to 1906. Now the Type 99 is indicative of yet again using year in order to in indicate the model number. So you might be sitting here going, well, 99, it's not year 99, nor is it 1999. Why would 99 be the year? And that's because you're looking at the wrong calendar. In the Japanese calendar, 99 would have equated to the year 2599, which in our calendar, or the I guess you'd say the Western calendar, would be 1939. So, this cartridge, or excuse me, this rifle does go into full scale production. However, the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor in 1941 and bring America into World War II, who then immediately starts sending troops to the Pacific. So now the Japanese find themselves caught up in a full-scale full scale war with a competent enemy and have to keep the 38th year rifle and its 6.5 millimeter cartridge around. Ultimately, they would never effectively replace the 6.5 millimeter cartridge and the 38th year rifle in Japanese service. It would continue to serve all the way until 1945. Now, there were a couple of other variants of this rifle developed during World War II, including a sniper variant as well as a paratrooper model, which had a removable buttstock. Now, this rifle, when it originally came out, was extremely features rich, and we'll talk about those features once we get to them in the actual features portion of this video. However, by 1943, with the tide of the war actively turning against the Japanese, they would have to reassess a lot of the features that they had on this rifle, and you would start to see these features disappear, starting with the dust cover. However, it was not exactly a deletion as much as an omission until we get even later into the war. Initially, in 1943, you would see the dust cover disappear. However, you would still have recesses milled into the receiver in order to receive the dust cover that they were no longer issuing out. Now, the majority of history that you read on this particular subject pretty much just says that they omitted that and continued to mill the receiver, and I suspect as best as I can figure, based off of what most historians say, is that it was easier and more cost-effective as far as materials were concerned to just omit the part completely instead of stopping the machines and going through whatever process you had to in order to remove the, the measure of cutting it into the receiver. Now, that would eventually disappear, and at that point it would constitute a deletion. But that was pretty much how the pattern went with all these Japanese omissions into deletions. It would start out as an omission, they would just not produce that part, but the cuts would still be in the stocks or receivers in order to have it installed, and then they would completely delete even the milling operation into whatever part to be able to receive that part they were no longer making. Now, in addition to that, I also wonder to some extent if the Japanese were not hoping that the tide would turn back in their favor, they would start pushing the Americans back, and then would be able to free up resources and machining time to be able to produce the parts that they were omitting, later deleting. And when you omit the part but still leave the recesses to be able to install it, then in the future, when it comes in for maintenance or, you know, whatever refurbishment, they can go ahead and install those dust covers. However, as we know, that's not how it went. And ultimately, eventually, these rifles would wind up being simplified to the absolute max. The uh, bayonet lug and cleaning rod would disappear. The sights would be simplified to just a aperture rear sight. The finish on the wood and metal would be more like it was in the same room as materials that should be finished. And then ultimately the stocks would just have a hole drilled into them so that you could run a bit of rope through them to act as a sling. And these are referred to as last ditch rifles. Now, for some reason, Japanese last ditch rifles get a lot of hate. And we're gonna go ahead and unpack this process just a little bit here. So, 
A lot of the information out there on the internet might tell you to never shoot a Japanese last ditch rifle, or in the best case scenario, go get your last ditch rifle checked out by a competent gunsmith. And I want to go ahead and like explore this overall process a little bit further. Now, guys, sorry about that. Guys, I did not serve in World War II, so I can't necessarily attest to what it is that troops experienced when it came to the last ditch version of these rifles, but I can address a couple of things that are for sure. First off, vast majority, or pretty much all, military surplus rifles probably ought to be checked out and certified by a qualified gunsmith. World War II rifles specifically are at a minimum 75 years old. They possibly or did see combat. They definitely saw military service and possibly heavy firing regimens. They then probably went out to other militaries to be used in, possibly in training or conflict with heavy firing regimens and then got distributed on the civilian market for who knows what type of treatment. You have no idea what type of condition your rifle is in until it's been checked out and certified by a qualified gunsmith. Just throwing that out there. I don't necessarily do it, and I'm not telling you you have to go do it. I'm just saying it seems kind of odd to point fingers at a single generational production of a rifle for needing to be certified by gunsmiths as opposed to other guns. In, in general, just, just to kind of frame that discussion there. Now, in addition to that, no military wins a battle or a war or any type of action by doing the enemy's job for them. And what I mean by that is building subpar rifles that cannot handle the pressures of the cartridges they're firing and having them come apart in the user's face does not guarantee victory. In fact, it actually ensures defeat at that point. You're actually better off issuing out pitchforks to your soldiers instead of subpar weapons that will explode in their faces. And that might seem kind of odd to split hairs about this with a country that was completely fine with like kamikaze attacks. However, kamikaze attacks were not to defend the overall practice, but at the very least that was meant to take out an enemy target, you know, like a battleship or something like that, as opposed to some dude standing in a foxhole firing shots at an approaching American wave and having his gun go off in his face. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't have near the same effect as a kamikaze attack, if it's successful. So... The rumors that these guns could not handle the pressures associated with them, this is a Mauser 98 action. It's plenty strong. All they had to do was get the heat treat right. And as far as I've been able to pick up from people who actually own and shoot last ditch rifles, they've had no issues with any of the guns showing any undue stress indicators. So... There's that aspect as well. Now, there are anecdotal stories from World War II of Marines and soldiers picking up Arasaka rifles and having them come apart in their face. You can't, I, I can't overlook those. You're absolutely right. But what about another plausible explanation? There is a version of these rifles that look just like them that were only ever meant for use with training ammunition, specifically wooden bullets in order to be able to teach soldiers uh, shooting fundamentals and all that type of stuff without using service ammunition. And these guns were not designed to withstand the pressures generated by ball ammunition. And these guns would even be marked as training rifles. However, those markings would be in Japanese symbols. And you get a bunch of grunts together who find a bunch of rifles, they're going to do grunt things, take those rifles out to the range and try them out, especially if they have ammo lying around. And they may not necessarily be able to distinguish Japanese markings. And that sounds like a recipe for having a gun blow up in your face. It seems far more likely that that was the outcome than actual battle rifles blowing up in their hands. I'm not saying one way or the other, I'm just saying there's a couple of facts and opinions to kind of chew on a little bit and take into your overall assessment of that information. Now, the Japanese would of course lose the war in 1945 and have to surrender their rifles and all that kind of stuff. So what became of these rifles after the war? Well, they would see some distribution in the Pacific, the Philippines, stuff like that. Several thousand would be rechambered over to 30-06 and by the United States military and issued to the South Koreans during the Korean War. Japan, or excuse me, Chinese forces who had captured these rifles would chamber them in 8 by 57 millimeter Mauser. And then you would see these pop up in a couple of different brush conflicts in like the Dutch East Indies and stuff like that. The rest of these rifles would either be destroyed or be brought home by American service members. And that is where we pretty much see these rifles in the United States. That's where they came in from. These are American bringbacks. Uh, 
But I have never seen or heard of a shipment of Arasaka rifles coming into like Classic Arms or something like that. It's probably never going to happen. I would be very surprised at this point. And that's very unfortunate because that means that ammunition is incredibly difficult to find for these rifles because there's not really a lot of demand out there. Not a lot of people shoot them. There's not brand new shipments of them coming in. And a lot of the surplus stuff from the war, pretty much all of that was destroyed. All right, now, I've covered the history in general of this particular rifle. Let's go ahead and talk about the history of this specific rifle. So some of you might have noticed that there seems to be some painting on this stock. So a couple of years ago, a buddy of mine, the owner of this rifle, walked into a gun shop and he saw this thing sitting on a rack. And as soon as he saw this painting, he pretty much knew that he was going to have to buy it. One thing that always stands to reason or stands to, to be true is that military surplus collectors love a story. And though it's very important to remember never buy the story, it's also exceedingly difficult to resist the urge to do so. So not only does this rifle have an interesting little bit of artwork on the buttstock, but it also came with a typed letter for the consignment sale. So somebody's grandfather passed away, they put a bunch of his guns on consignment, and at the very least with this rifle, if not anything else they put on consignment from him, they included a little sheet explaining its background. So apparently this was a war bring back from a member of the 132nd Infantry Regiment, which served with the Americal Division, which came to be known as the 23rd Infantry Division. So, uh, there's, there's a lot more information talking about um, some of the personal history and features of this rifle that I'm not necessarily going to go into. However, it is very interesting to see this type of almost trench art imparted onto a rifle. Now, whether or not anything on that sheet is true, well, at the very least, what they have in there about the bolt and the overall condition of the rifle seems to be accurate. So we don't really have a lot of reason to not trust that the origin of this painting is true. However, it is something to consider that you want to be very, very thorough in your research before you pull your trigger on military surplus rifles, especially if they come with an interesting story. Something to keep in mind there. Now, that pretty much covers the history portion, so let's go ahead and get into features. Now, this is a 25-inch barreled rifle, just a, just a hair under 26 inches, actually. We have a blade-type front sight with protective ears. If you guys can make that out. We have a full-length Stock with handguard, which is fantastic for not burning your fingies in the middle of combat. We have our cleaning rod located here. A bayonet lug for the Type 30 sword bayonet located right here. We have a chrome line bore, which is actually exceedingly interesting. This is the first and probably only rifle we're talking about in the series that has a chrome line bore. It wasn't very common for the time. And the Japanese only did it because, well... It's a rather moist environment, the Pacific, lots of salt water and all that kind of stuff, and they wanted to make sure that their bores would hold up. Now, like all features of this rifle, by 1945, they were no longer chrome lining the bores. You had to live long enough to have to be concerned about your bore rusting out. So, there's that. Now, continuing down our stock, we do have side-mounted sling swivels. We also have a location where you normally would have found a monopod. Now, as you can see, the holes are still present for the monopod, but the monopod is gone. I don't know if this rifle originally had the monopod and it has disappeared over time, or if this was produced at a time in which the monopod was no longer being included. There's there's a trickle-down effect that, has occur that occurs with that. So if it was, in fact, and I'm, I'm kind of going to go, I'm kind of going to err on the side of there was a monopod omission at this point, but we still have the mounting point because it isn't a deletion yet. Now we have finger grooves right here, which are actually not in a bad spot overall. And then we have our rear sight. Now our rear sight is ladder adjustable. As you can see there. And also has two swing out legs to act as 
anti-aircraft sights. Now, we actually have a lot to unpack with this rear sight yet, so let's go ahead and get into it. This rear sight is calibrated out to 1,500 meters, and this is where the majority of YouTubers would tell you that that's a very optimistic engagement distance with this particular rifle. And, I mean, they're not wrong, because shooting at a single man standing out in the field at 1,500 meters with iron sights, identifying a target at 1,500 meters with iron sights is gonna be rather difficult, especially when it's man size, and he's not wearing orange or something like that. Like, actually, if you're talking about World War II, he probably is wearing a color that matches his background. And in addition to that, he probably also doesn't want to get shot, so he's trying to make himself real small, because I get real small when I get shot at. So, 1,500 meters on a single man standing out in the field, probably not, probably not going to work out so hot for you. But a squad, platoon, or company-sized element reining in 1,500 meter shots on an enemy fighting position, that could work. That volley type fire aspect when you don't have enough or any machine guns around to be able to do the same type of thing is better than nothing. Which is what that distance is actually meant for on this particular rifle. Now, these anti-aircraft sights. This is an interesting addition to this rifle. It really is. So, once again, this is not meant for a single rifleman to try to shoot down like an F4U4 Corsair or something like that. That's not going to work out. That's not how, that's, that's not reality. This would once again be the best case scenario. You would get a squad, platoon, company of dudes together because you didn't have any machine guns or you were tired of getting strafed by enemy fighters and then you could at the very least pop open these sights and attempt to shoot down an enemy aircraft. Now, in addition to that, I think this requirement came out of China, which didn't necessarily have the most advanced airplanes at the time up until, you know, fighting uh, flying tigers with their P-40 Tomahawks and all that kind of stuff, which I can imagine that this would have some trouble taking down a P-40 Tomahawk. If you're, if you're talking about like actual Chinese aircraft, uh, this was actually probably fairly vi viable. However, once we had the Americans entering the war with a much faster and heavier built aircraft, uh, this is a, there's a reason that it doesn't take very long for these anti-aircraft sights to disappear off of these rifles. Now, before the war was over, even the adjustable ladder rear sight would disappear and you would literally just have this peep type rear aperture for your rear sight. Now, coming to our chamber area here, you might see there seems to be some disturbance right there. And that comes from the destruction of the chrysanthemum, which was the seal of the emperor. So, the chrysanthemum was a 16-petal chrysanthemum stamped into each and every rifle in the Japanese Imperial Army. And that identified these as being property of the emperor. Now, in 1945, when the, Japanese, when the Japanese lost the war, the order was put out that every chrysanthemum on every rifle had to be destroyed. So now, that makes any Arasaka rifle with an unmolested mum, as it's referred to, pretty desirable by collectors today. So this one clearly has been struck. It is no longer visible on this particular rifle. We actually have a slight divot over the chamber right there. Now we come back to here, we have our marking, which comes out to 9.9 type. Getting back to our receiver. So as we can see, we do not have a dust cover. We do have the cutout for it, but we do not have the dust cover included. And you know what, let's just go ahead and talk about that real fast. Now, a lot of the conventional wisdom or myth surrounding this particular rifle is that Japanese soldiers would remove the dust cover because it has a tendency to, to clink and clank whenever they're moving around it and would give away their position. And that's something, once again, I wasn't there, so I don't know. However, from what I understand, I don't think that makes a lot of sense, specifically for a Japanese soldier. It makes a lot of sense that it makes noise. It makes a lot of sense that you might not want that. But there's a couple of things that we got to kind of talk about here to begin with. So let's talk about the Japanese military during World War II. So what you're talking about is a conscript army when it comes to the enlisted side of probably 
farm boys or very poor city workers and stuff like that. Families that did, they came from families that didn't necessarily have a lot of prestige. They didn't have any honor. And this is a time when Japan is very heavy on the Bushido code. This, uh, this Japanese style of living and interpretation of honor and all this kind of stuff. Where there is no higher honor than serving the emperor. And there's no better way to honor your family than faithfully and honorably serving the emperor. That's a way to elevate not just your family, but also yourself. And that's a lot to hope for for a poor Japanese kid thrust into service in the Japanese military. That's why these guys were so hellbent on performing for their emperor, be that kamikaze attacks or bonsai attacks and all that kind of stuff. There was a very deep sense of self-worth involved in winning that type of honor for your family, for your emperor. So the idea that a Japanese soldier would just carelessly remove that dust cover and toss it aside and some way modify or damage the emperor's property is kind of a bold statement, in, in all honesty. So now, what we, we tend to run into any time that we're evaluating an enemy, and a big mistake that we can make, this thing that we run into, is putting ourselves as the enemy, thinking how we think, thinking about how we would attack ourselves and all that kind of stuff, how we would react to different input and all that kind of stuff, and how we would counter us reacting to that input as though we are fighting ourselves. And there's, to some extent, it's really great to, you know, plan to fight yourself because obviously you know your strengths and weaknesses. However, you're going to respond to your strengths and weaknesses how you respond to your strengths and weaknesses. Somebody else might have a better response or honestly, more accurately, a worse response in a lot of different situations. So that's an important thing to take into account is somebody else's culture, what drives somebody to do the things that they do. They might think in a very different manner and if you're not ready for their, their approach to things, in this case Japanese dedication to dying honorably, you might miss some very important aspects. So in the American military, absolutely. If we had something that wasn't working for us, we would go ahead and make the command decision on our spot to go ahead and adjust that in order to be able to make some sort of pivotal change that was going to win the battle. That is something that is encouraged in the American military. That adaptability, that on-the-spot change whenever the situation turns against you and some like field expedient methods to do so. That's a big deal for us. However, in the Japanese military, removing you know some piece of your gear in order to make it work better because you think it's going to work better is not an acceptable practice and it's not like that's just going to result in like okay well you're going to pull extra latrine duty or your your weekend pass is canceled or something like that no that's going to be lashes or something along those lines it's going to be a very serious punishment for disrespecting your emperor if you get caught doing that it's a real different approach than what we're used to in the American or westernized militaries, especially during World War II. It's not, it's not just Japan that did this type of thing. There are a lot of other places that did not have the flexibility to make their own decisions about whatever it was that was going on. It's a very, it's a very Western and American idea to begin with that has grown over time into the current status in most militaries, but still not all. Again, I'm, I'm going down a little bit of a, a rabbit hole here. Why don't we go ahead and dial it back? The only way that I can see, the only circumstance that I can see happening is if a Japanese officer put out an order to remove the dust covers to, better, to be better suited for a night attack or something along those lines. And at that point, it wouldn't be toss them into the swamp. It would be throw them in your rucksack, put them in your foxhole, leave them at your fighting position, where it is so that when we get back, you can put that dust cover right back on there so we can keep doing what it's supposed to be doing and we don't dishonor the emperor. Something along those lines. That's that is more. That's the only outcome that I see even mildly believable, as opposed to the equivalent of Japanese Joe Snuffy, Private Joe Snuffy, just tossing away his dust cover and going into battle like it's going to be no big deal. All right, so that's enough about the dust cover. Let's go ahead and get back to this bolt. We have a Gewehr 98 style bolt, which is cock on open. We have the beefy lugs, a uh, Mauser style release for the bolt. We have, whoops, there we go, a last shot hold open for the magazine. We have a five shot 
magazine. I think I already said we had the strip clips, right? We got strip clips. And then on the back, we have a very different safety than what uh, most Mazer actions are, we're used to having. This safety, you press in and rotate, and it places the weapon on safe. Disconnects the striker. And then when you want to place it to fire, you press in, turn counterclockwise, and then the weapon is ready to fire. Now, as we can see here, there's some pretty excellent knurling on the end. This would disappear over time to where it would get more and more refined, so or simplified, I guess you'd say. Whereas this is just beautifully done, actually. It's really some great craftsmanship, honestly. This rifle, in its heyday, had so much beauty involved in its construction. I, just abs I, I actually really like this rifle. Now you'll, you'll note that we have a straight bolt handle with an almond shape uh, bolt knob. We have a semi pistol grip right here. And you'll also note that right here we seem to have what almost looks like a crack, but it's not a crack. It's actually on every Japanese rifle. And what they would do is they would cut this section of the stock and then reattach it and glue it so as to give the stock a little bit more strength. You'll also note here we have a cupped butt plate. By the end of the war, these would be replaced by a wooden butt stock, or a wooden butt plate, I guess you'd say. But earlier in the war, they would be cupped like this in order to give the stock more rigidity. All right, guys. Well, that pretty much covers features, actually. We're moving right along on this video. I'm actually pretty excited. I thought it was going to take me longer to unpack all those things and, you know, wind up down some rabbit holes and stuff. So, with that being the case, let's go ahead and get into our grading criteria. Now, we're going to talk about four different categories at five points per category with a possible 20 points overall. We're going to talk about ergonomics, features, firepower, and accuracy. Now, ergonomics. Right off the bat, I like semi-pistol grip stocks. It helps it pull into my shoulder, gives me a nice secure grip on the rifle. I feel like I've got it locked in pretty good. Now, length of pull on this rifle is, is short, which is not unexpected for the, you know, the group of people that it was made for. However, I notice that it's not uncomfortably short, where I found the Mosin Nagant to be a little too short and the number four Enfield to be, that particular example seemed to be rather short. This, I've actually not really got to readjust my head or anything like that whenever I get behind it. This seems to be at a good length for me. And I don't know where that length is coming from that, that makes this so handy. It looks so short. But speaking of handy as well, we haven't really been talking about weight in these comparisons. I've kind of been leaving that out because most of the rifles for the time are pretty comparable in weight overall. However, this rifle's actually kind of handy. Like, it's, it's surprisingly kind of lightweight. I kind of appreciate that. All right, now, of course, for, for basics and ergonomics here, you know, we have handguards. This is pretty, this is a standard in all the militaries by World War II, and that's, that's, that's a good attri attribute. However, at that point, we're kind of looking at, like, the basics, right? You know, we've only had a couple of rifles not have semi-pistol grips, and this is a really good length, and yes, it's, it's very handy and all that kind of stuff. Now, the finger grooves are actually in a really good spot as opposed to on the Mosin Nagant where I found them to be too close to the actual center point of the rifle. This extends this, this extends in the proper manner for the rifle. It's, I do wish they were just a little bit further, but with this front sling swivel, that would kind of get in the way of that. Now, we do have a straight bolt handle, which is not my preferred for, like, stowed or slung type things, because there's a good chance that that would happen if it got caught on something, and that would really annoy me. Or it could, like, poke me in the back or something along those lines. So from, like, a non-combat use, I'm not a big fan of the straight bolt handle. However, I do like these side sling swivels. I think that's a really great place to run a sling, personally. So, honestly, guys, it's kind of middle of the ground. So, we're going to go ahead and give this a 3 out of 5 for ergonomics. Uh, for a lot of these rifles, we're talking about the limitations of the bolt action rifles. So, they, they kind of wind up mirroring each other in a lot of the grading criteria. So, let's go ahead and talk about features, right? All right, so features-wise, we have the Type 30 bayonet. I prefer sword type bayonets. I like having a, a a grippable section, a cross guard and all that kind of stuff. So if I have to use a bayonet as a knife instead of a bayonet, it works 
like a knife instead of uh, socket type bayonets that are just complete garbage to fight with as a knife instead of on attached to a rifle even though they were meant for that you know if I'm in a scenario where I, I lost my rifle but I have my bayonet I would like to be able to fight with the bayonet for no other reason than just to have something in my hand now of course this originally would have been a very features rich rifle but we have to talk about the features that we actually have present so we do still have our ladder type rear sight but these anti-aircraft sights we're, we're gonna we're gonna break those out of the the accuracy portion and talk about them specifically in features really not that great of a feature this was not like it was not on this rear sight that uh, the battle was carried or something like that and the really it probably should have been the first omission if we're being completely honest so not a big fan of the anti-aircraft sight uh, we're missing our dust cover the, the dust cover to me, I guess it's kind of six of one, half a dozen of another. Bolt actions can get dirt and muck and stuff like that into the action, so it's not a bad thing to have a dust cover. But especially when it comes to the clink clank and all that kind of stuff, I can see where it would be very annoying. Now, we do have a 98 style action, which I appreciate. That, that's, that's, a, that's a well designed action, and these actions are well renowned for being able to handle a lot of pressure. They were used quite extensively. Uh, post-war for different types of sporterized chamberings and all that kind of stuff. Now, we don't have our monopod, so that's fine. The monopod was at actually a really weird length that wasn't necessarily great for shooting in a, in a very low prone position, but you really couldn't do much from it from like a kneeling position either. So you, it was almost like only good for shooting off the edge of some sort of, I, I guess, entrenchment or something like that. All right, guys. Well, that's pretty much our features, except for the chrome line bore, which I actually really appreciate. Like that is, even though I didn't necessarily make it all the way to the end of the war, that is a really good addition to this rifle that not a lot of other rifles out there have. So, hmm, that's difficult when it comes to features because it's it's missing a lot of the features that made this rifle so individual. However, I wouldn't give it a three out of four in this case because though it does have all the standards, it does have all the standards plus an additional. So we're gonna give this thing a four out of five on features. All right, let's talk about firepower. Well, first off, we have a 7.7 .7 millimeter cartridge, which is, which is ballistically similar to a 303 British. So we have a 30 caliber cartridge working here. That's great. That is more or less the standard in militaries at this point. It's a five shot magazine. That's the standard in militaries at this point. It runs off of Mauser strip clips. That's the standard in militaries at this point. It's a, you know, it's a bolt action rifle. So you, can only shoot it as fast as you can turn the action. That's a standard at this point. I do have to say that the bolt is really not that smooth in comparison to a Gewehr 98, uh, the 98K specifically. I found the 98K to actually be a, a really smooth bolt, and I am under enthusiastic about this particular bolt, if I'm being 100% honest. Um, it's strong lockup and all that kind of stuff. It's just I, I'm not a big fan of that. What I am a big fan of, though, is this gross motor movement safety. One thing I don't like about this safety, however, well, no. So, with a Mauser type flag safety, if you have it in the center position, whenever you rotate it into the safe and then into safe, and then you try to come up and shoot at something, it will obscure your sights and remind you, hey, dummy, you've got your safety on. And this doesn't necessarily do it in the same way, but there is a cutout right here in the safety that if you pulled this up and you saw that and you had the training to know beforehand, you would know that your weapon was not on fire and it would just be a real quick gross motor movement to get that out of the way and get yourself back into action. So I do appreciate that. Recoil on this was actually surprisingly light. I've read some reports saying that these are heavy in recoil, and I didn't really feel it. I, I had no real issues with recoil on this rifle. Especially for being 30 caliber and lightweight, I had no real complaints. So I don't know 
I don't know who's complaining about that, but, you know, to each their own, I guess. So from a firepower standpoint, I'm going to give this a 3 out of 5. All right, so now let's talk about accuracy. All right, so we took this to the range, and guys, all of our accuracy shooting in this series is done at 25 yards because of issues we had on the first episode with the Mauser 98K. We tried to take it to 100 yards, and it was just all over the place. We, spent, we shot up all of our ammunition we had out there that day trying to get it on paper. So what I wound up having to revert to was the 25-yard target I shot beforehand just to make sure that I could figure out where holdovers were and all that kind of stuff. And unfortunately, I also had to stay consistent with how that 25-yard target was shot. So I shot it rather rapidly. And now that has been more or less the grading standard that we've been using since that day. Because I got shooting footage for three rifles that day. And that's just what we ran off of was me repping out the rounds at 25 yards and seeing what the groupings look like. Now, admittedly, I did shoot this a tad slower with this particular rifle. But that is because... I was shooting at this target right here, and I wanted to make sure that at the very least I was going to land them all on paper instead of having something trailing off into the target backer over here. So I did shoot them a tad slower, but I, I tried to pick up the speed a little bit closer to the end and, and get them repped out. However, at 25 yards with 174 grain full metal jacket bullets, at 20, I did say 25 yards, right? Anyway, we got this one and a quarter inch grouping. All right, now guys, in general, ammunition is incredibly hard to find for this rifle, so I only fired eight rounds out of it on this particular range trip. Three rounds to go ahead and see where impact was, and then the next five for the grouping. It was, a, it was, it was one run through because, like, at least it doesn't seem like Arasaka ammunition costs have gone up since COVID, but Availability has not improved, and the costs were already high at almost $2 a round. So, we managed to get that five-shot grouping at one and a quarter inches. So, how does that rack and stack against everything else? So, the Mosin Nagant shot a two and seven-eighths inch group. The Mauser 98K shot a, like, six-inch group. And... The number four Mark I Star shot a two and three eighths inch group. So right now, this rifle's winning the accuracy game quite handily. Actually, like it's doing exceedingly well. That is an absolutely fantastic group. And if you take a, it's it's actually incredibly well centered and all that kind of stuff like that's that's a fairly decent group for kind of just repping it out so with that being the case and we did go ahead and push it out to 100 and shot it there a little bit but i'm not necessarily including that because we just shot steel but at this point guys I think I'm going to have to give that a 5 out of 5 for accuracy. This is the only rifle to have shot just over an inch. So, with that being the case, I guess we just have a really good example here. And it's definitely well beating out everything else we have so far. So, alright guys. So, with that being the case, I actually think I lost track of the scoring. I think... That was a 15 out of 20, but go ahead and uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and roll in the score right here. But anyway, for some people that might be a shock that this rifle did this, this well. But 
Honestly, in comparison to a lot of other rifles in World War II, this rifle is just as good. There's a lot of preconceived misconceptions that are exceedingly negative about this rifle that are just not fair in all reality. I think a lot of it has to do with there's not a wide proliferation of them. There's probably a lot of a, um, a World War II kind of propaganda aspect of trash talking the enemy's rifle because you don't want to tell the people at home how great the enemy's equipment is. You don't want to tell them that. You want to tell them how terrible everything is and how they're the worst people possible because that's what keeps people on the home front invested in the conflict overall. Now, the sights do further support the 5 out of 5, just so you know. I absolutely love this peep sight. It's a tad small for my uses, so it doesn't pick up nearly as fast as the number 4 Mark One. However, it's incredibly easy to read the sight. It's very easy to work with. And though ladder adjustable is not exactly my favorite sighting system, it is workable. And the adjustable portion of the site is also a peep type setup. All right, guys. Well, I think that pretty much concludes my thoughts on this particular rifle. If I were to throw out one more thing, it would be that I at the very least had a dead hold at 25 yards, which is a little bit surprising. Everything else is patterned a little bit higher at 25 yards than this particular rifle has. So I think it might be a little bit easier to reach out to distance. I'm noticing that when we switch to the flip up sight, it starts at 300 yards and then our next correction up from there is 400 yards. So perhaps I need to take this out to the 400 yard range and, and play around with it between 100 and 400 and see how well it is, how easy it is to be able to switch between small targets for that. But at this point guys, that's pretty much what I got. I appreciate your time, and I appreciate uh, my subscribers. So, have a good day.